am Dustin Abbott and I'm here today to give you my definitive review of the new Sony a7C camera. This of course is uh, Sony's most recent release and one I think that probably took a lot of us by surprise in that essentially it is taking primarily the internals of the a7 III and uh, condensing them down into a camera body that's more the size of an a6600. And so this is the most compact mirrorless full frame camera I believe that you can get right now. And today we're going to evaluate whether or not it is a worthy alternative to a, what is a very good camera in the a7 Mark III. And so we'll see what's improved, maybe what's regressed a little bit, and all of that as a part of our review today. Today's episode is brought to you by Ridge, the wallet redefined. It's time to ditch that bulky old wallet full of stuff you don't need and move to a sleek aluminum, titanium, or carbon fiber Ridge wallet. It takes up a little more room than a credit card, has RFID blocking technology to protect your information, and comes with a lifetime warranty. Visit ridge.com backslash Dustin and use code Dustin to get 10% off your order along with free shipping worldwide. Now this is the definitive review and so that means we're going to take our time, we're going to go through things in detail, everything from the specifications, the build, the handling of the camera, the autofocus performance, how it does for video, and then also of course breaking down the sensor performance, talking a little bit about the uh, the FE 28 to 60 millimeter f4 to 5.6 new retractable zoom kit lens here. However, if you want more information on that, I will have a uh, a, a short review, but a uh, going through my format that you can access taking a look at here. But we're going to start this all off by taking a look at the build and the handling and what is different here in this more rangefinder style uh, camera body here. So let's jump in and let's take a look at it. So let's take a closer look at the a7C hands-on. So first of all, I did want to show you it with the uh, the actual new kit lens applied. That new kit lens is only 45 millimeters in length. And so um, it, it is a retractable zoom, which means you have to bring it out to the 28 millimeter position before you can use it. But when it's in its retracted position, it's really compact and only weighs 167 grams. And so that means you're not adding on much weight when it comes to that. So a few things about the physical design here. Our main change obviously is the fact that we do, we have the articulating screen like the A7S Mark III. That's very, very welcome. It's very useful. But I have one major criticism and that is that we have made zero progress here in terms of the functionality of the actual touchscreen. So there's no navigating of the menus. That's true also if you go into the quick menu where you've got no navigation options there. So, I mean, that's just a liability. You can do very simple touch things. You can move a focus point around. In video, you can touch to focus, but you know, there's not a whole lot of functionality there in that. And the problem is, is that we've also lost the joystick for navigation. And so, you know, frankly, you're left with only one navigation option. And so you've got to use this combination dial slash rocker and use it in the rocker way. And um, so you've got only one option for actually operating your menus. So that's, you know, that's, you know, somewhat of a, a loss there. Also a major loss to me is that you're losing the C3 button that's normally over on this side on, you know, AC. Uh, A7 bodies. You're also losing C1 and C2 and you don't have a focus lock button. So what that means is you've got four buttons that you could customize that are no longer here. And so, I mean, obviously that's a liability if you really like to customize and, you know, create shortcuts through those buttons. You're also missing the front dial here, and so this is more like a, you know an A6000 series, no front dial. So you're gonna have to do exposure changes and or aperture changes with these rear dials. Exposure compensation is still there, as is the mode dial. Those are pretty typical, though we no longer have a lock on that. One other thing that is worth uh, pointing out is that they have moved the record button up to a really prominent position. You can actually quickly go between stills and video just by you know, choosing which button you select. And so uh, that's obviously a plus, you know, kind of with the intended purpose of the camera in mind. 
So obviously the main physical change as far as the dimensions is that you have no center stack. And so that would normally house the viewfinder, but you've got an A6000 series style kind of range finder, view, um, viewfinder over here on the side. Now, the resolution of the viewfinder is the same as what we have seen before. I think it's 2.36 million dot. And so it's okay in terms of resolution. However, it's a smaller um, actual magnification and smaller viewfinder. And so instead of a 0 0.50 um, or 0 0.5 inch, it is a 0 0.39. And so it's just, um, it's, it's a little bit pokey to, uh, you know, put your eye in there and look at it. Not my favorite thing, but you know, that's the sacrifice to get the smaller dimensions. Now, they had to redesign the left side here because of the hinge, and, but they've done a really good job, I think. Your bottom, you know, instead of just these kind of dangling ports, you've got actual doors. And so down here, you've got headphone monitoring, micro HDMI, and USB-C. And you can charge view via the USB-C. Up top, you have got a side opening port that does have a, a microphone input jack. And furthermore, they have a one memory card slot, but it's located here on the side, which is a real relief to me. I was afraid that like the A6000 series, you're gonna end up with the, you know, the memory card down here in the battery compartment, which I really personally hate. One other thing that is upgraded is that our hot shoe, you know, or multi -in interface port um, does allow you to get digital audio if you're using the new Sony microphones. And so that's a, obviously a nice feature for, again, for content creation. You'll note that the, basically the width of the grip is about as narrow as they can make it while still putting the, um, you know, the FZ battery in there. And so um, you do get actually about 30 extra uh, shots out of the battery. And so that's a plus. And they've got a whole new grip material that kind of almost looks a little bit like a, kind of like carbon fiber. It's not, it's, it's more modern looking compared to the older style grips but it's also smoother, and I don't think it actually has as much grip to it. You know, as is typical for a body this size, you have to kind of, you know, put your pinky down below and support. There's not as much to hang on to there, but the grip has some decent contours. It's not bad. Um, it's not amazing for someone with larger hands, but it's not bad. So the raw physical dimensions, it's 124 millimeters in width. It is 71.1 millimeters in height, which is about 25 millimeters less than the A7 III due to losing that center stack. And it is about, it's 59.7, right? About 60 millimeters in depth. And so again, that is a significant difference from the A7 III. The whole combination weighs only 509 grams. So about 150 or so grams, actually I think about 160 grams less. And so you really do have a, a nicely compact and lightweight body, which really is, well, it's right there in the name. And so as far as the ergonomics, I recognize that there's quite a bit that's been sacrificed at the altar of compactness here, but I do have to say at the end of the day, I'm less delighted in the ergonomic control. Fortunately, however, you know, that is, is the, the worst of my criticisms. And I will note, of course, that I think that this camera body really has been designed around those who are going to prioritize going small and light. I mean, that's really the main reason for the existence here. I mean, the C stands for compact. And so um, because of that, I think that if you're prioritizing smaller and lighter lenses, it really is the best way to get your you know bang for buck out of this. Now, as I've already alluded to, the new kit lens does save you a significant amount of weight and size in its retracted positions. It is about 40 millimeters shorter. It's only around 47 millimeters. And so it's pretty close to a half the overall length of the 28 to 70 millimeter that was a kit lens previously. And as you can see, uh, if you take a look at my review, that while I don't necessarily love the, um, again, the ergonomics of the lens itself, I was really pleasantly surprised by the optical performance, which was much stronger than what I expected it to be. And so if you're interested in the possibility of buying this with the kit lens, and I recommend that you take a look at the review of the uh, FE 28 to 60 millimeter. 
I would be remiss if I didn't also mention a series of lenses that I think are a fantastic pairing for the A7C, and that is Samyang's, they call them their tiny series, Samyang Rokinon. Uh, the um, Korean lens manufacturer has a number of really quite optically excellent and well-performing lenses that are really compact and light, and I've really enjoyed using them on the A7C. And so I actually own the 18mm f2.8, the uh, 45 millimeter f1.8, 75 millimeter f1.8. I'm filming with it at the moment. And then also I shot a lot uh, with, particularly with the new 35 millimeter f1.8 that I've actually done a lot of my reviewing on the a7C. And so these are, I think, a really great pairing for the camera because they're, they're very competent. They perform really well on the a7C, but of course they're also light. And I think they also match the, you know, the budget considerations that, you know, they're relatively inexpensive. And so I think that those are also some good uh, lenses to consider. Now, as far as the uh, internals here, we have inherited the autofocus from the a7 III, which is a good thing because the a7 III inherited its autofocus from the a9. And so in many ways, you've got a focus system, I believe, that punches above its weight here. And it has had some mild improvements uh, in that, obviously, Sony has been working to radically improve uh, real-time tracking, both in stills and video. And you're also getting a benefit of some of the improved algorithms that were developed for the new a7s mark iii and so what i found was really really fantastic video performance in terms of just being very steady you know in shots like this of uh, tracking my face eyes really well um, i found the focus system was fantastic for uh, doing tracking for either portraits but also for events, just locking onto the eye and not budging from it. And so really, really fantastic. What you end up with is the 693 phase detect uh, autofocus points that are supported by 425 contrast AF points. You have a 93% of the sensor coverage. And so, I mean, it's just fantastic. I mean, it tracks really well. And you also get a little bit of improvement over the a7 III when it comes to tracking in that, you know, there is the benefit of, you know, a slightly newer technology in terms of the focus system. But beyond that, we have also got a, a few improvements. Um, 10 frames per second, like the a7 III. But now you can also shoot with the silent shutter um, and still get the 10 frames per second. So certainly in some environments, that's going to be very advantageous. The buffer depth has also increased. We're up to 115 RAW or 223 JPEG on the A7C versus 89 RAW images or 177 JPEGs on the A7 III. And so that extra bit of buffer depth just means that you get more out of that uh, focus system potentially if you're wanting to track action with it. And so, um, you know, already the A7 III was fantastic. The A7C is just a little bit better in a number of of ways and that of course is you know supremely welcome in a camera like this and so I, I really have enjoyed it for its autofocus performance that frankly just feels really mature you know Sony's been doing a great job with this and that that tech just seems like it's really hitting its stride and uh, has, has really matured to to great usability at this point the a7C has also inherited the video capabilities of the a7 III. So uh, that's really, for the most part, that's a good thing because a7 III is an incredibly competent uh, video rig. But at the same time, I do have to say I'm a little less impressed by the overall specs, you know, several years down the road because the competition has advanced, you know, and so now a limit of 30 frames per second in, uh, in 4K is, you know, not particularly impressive. So you have to drop to 1080 to be able to do slow motion, you know, 120 frames per second. And so that's, you know, just more of a limiting principle now in 2020 than what it was several years ago. At the same time, however, you've got a lot of good things going on. I mean, those focus improvements, the, you know, ability to monitor the screen from the front. You've also got beyond that, you've got S-Log2, S-Log3, you've got the ability to shoot HLG, and so you can get high dynamic range. And there are some actual improvements here that, you know, again, are inherited. You know, again, some focus alg algorithms from the A7S3 
Even better though is that you've got the removal of the 2959 limit and so now you can you know record without time limits and so I've already found that to be very very useful for example when I'm filming uh, like teaching sessions where a lot of times I would have to be really conscious of you know not bu bumping up against that you know basically 30 minute barrier and so now to not have to worry about that is just one less thing that you know you have going on in the back of your mind while you're trying to focus on the material you're trying to disseminate. And so that's obviously very useful. There are some other things that are inherited. You've now got a blue uh, focus peaking overlay color option. You have the ability to shoot in vertical format. <laughs> I don't, I, that's not my thing, but uh, maybe it is for you. You also have the ability to uh, use it now for, uh, for streaming. And so it's just designed around some additional functionalities, I think, for content creators right out of the box. And so certainly a lot of, uh, of positives there. It also inherits the same uh, 24 megapixel uh, BSI backlit sensor that we saw on the a7 III, which is actually really, really good news because that is one of Sony's very best sensors. And in terms of its performance, it really is fantastic. And so we're going to jump in and we're going to take a look at the sensor performance, dynamic range, uh, ISO performance, and to just take a look at, you know, how it performs. So let's jump in and let's take a look. So we're going to start off by taking a look at the ISO performance. And so first of all, I want to show you just base ISO, ISO 100 here. Everything is, of course, beautifully clean. Um, all the blacks are nice and inky. And I just want to give you a close look at how things should look in terms of our colors, our detail, smoothness there inside the um, you know, zone where the, the mirror is, the yellow here. So you get a good sense of what the baseline is at ISO 100. So at ISO 200, we would expect that everything looks identical, and it certainly does. No noise there, no problem. Likewise, at ISO 400, everything looks identical. There's really no penalty at all for moving up to ISO 400. That's true also at ISO 800, where, as you can see, everything is still very, very clean. Detail, color saturation, contrast, all of those things look basically the same. We can see moving on to ISO 1600 that everything remains very, very clean. Color saturation looks good. Uh, even the shadow area here, you can just begin to see the faintest amount of noise that is there, but it is it's basically undetectable even at a pixel level. At 3200, we can see that now it's just slightly more evident that there is some noise there in that shadow area. Looking inside here, there's the faintest bit of noise on the mirror. And as I look at this area and into the shadows, uh, there's a little bit of like pattern noise there. There's no discoloration, saturation, and contrast levels look essentially identical. If we move on to 6400, you see the same basic truths with just a little bit more obvious pattern noise beginning. Now I can see the faintest bit of it in the shadow area here on the reds. But if we look like at the timer face, it looks incredibly clean. And if we pan over here into the, you know, the pure shadow area, you can see that there's a little bit of, of noise in this kind of transition area of, you know, kind of brighter area to pure dark, but it's still really, really clean and at a global level looks fantastic. Likewise, at ISO 12800, viewed at a global level, you really would not be able to tell any difference. And so just realize that, I mean, you're probably looking at a larger size than what would be shared on social media anyway. And then zooming on in, we can see again, there's just a little bit of growing noise inside certain areas in the shadow zone right here. It's a little bit more obvious, but it's by very small degrees, you know, a little bit rougher here. But I mean, this is, you know, so far it's delivering a really great performance at, at 12,800. So at 25,600, you can see now there's a little uh, noise that's showing up on the face there. I would say we've lost a faint bit of contrast in the blacks, but as you can see, everything still looks really quite good here. There's still a nice edge of delineation between this black and then the background. Everything is rougher down in this zone for sure, and you can see definitely pattern noise in the colors. However, the colors themselves, saturation levels are still good, not quite as deep here because of the noise that's starting to raise some of the uh, shadow information. But overall, it's still very, very usable. And looking at it globally, we're not seeing any color shifts. Everything looks great. 
Now the final stop is to, to in the you know natural range is to 51,200, and it's here where you really can globally see a big difference. So I've got 25,600 on the left, and then 51,200 on the right, and you can see now that the shadows have really raised. You can see a bit of discoloration. I'll zoom in here and show you what I'm talking about. You can just see a little bit of banding that's come into there, and also obviously a lot more uh, just kind of roughness that causes the shadows to lift. And that does come with a cost of contrast, which, you know, is lost to some degree. So you can see that this, you know, what should be more of a solid black background is no longer the same. But overall, I mean, I would say through 25,600, really, really great performance. And then with some reduction at the limit at 51,200. So let's talk about a dynamic range and we'll start with shadow recovery. And so on the left, we have our baseline image. On the right, we have an image that was underexposed purposely by one stop and then was recovered. And so we're particularly looking at shadow areas to see if that information has been recovered smoothly and without any loss of information. And so as we can see here, that's certainly the case. It looks basically identical to the, you know, the natural baseline exposure. Looked at globally, we can see that a two-stop recovery globally looks fantastic. Um, it also looks great at a pixel level. It looks basically still identical to our original exposure here. No issues. At three stops of recovery, we can see the tiniest bit of noise in that shadow information, but you're only going to detect that as a, at a pixel level. And looking down at this, this area where it should be dark, but you know, you, sometimes roughness starts to show up, we can see that information looks good. The uh, contrast on the uh, grip here still looks quite good to my eye. Even at four stops of recovery, we can see that that contrast level looks good. The noise level, even in the shadow, is still really clean inside the, the mirror area. And you can see a little bit of pattern noise that's come here after four stops. But all things considered, looking at a global level, it's a very, very natural recovery. And just for perspective, here is what we started with. And so you can see that all of that information on you know, the grip, for example, that was all completely crushed before and has all been recovered in uh, post-recovery here. So shadow recovery is, is quite excellent. So let's go the other direction. Now, in this case, it's looking at the areas that are bright here where we're going to look for loss of information. And so we've got a little bit of, you know, a reflected light here. And so that can will become a hot spot, the brighter face of the uh, timer. And then of course the uh, book here, and we'll see how well we recover, you know, these various things. So on the right here, we have a one stop highlight recovery. And so I've overexposed purposely by one stop. And as we can see so far, Far, everything looks identical. We have not lost uh, no information here. So at two stops, we can see that this uh, highlight area, it's maybe just the tiniest bit brighter, but I think we've pulled back all the information. The uh, timer face looks really nice and clean. Color, bright yellow color here is still looking good. And uh, as we pull down here, like to the life book and the contrast on the very bright spine of the portrait book, all of that looks very, very similar to what we started with with our baseline. Now often at three stops of highlight recovery is where we start to lose a little bit of information. And so you can see here that it's a little less natural in terms of our area. You can see there's a little bit of lost, like a, a hot spot that's not quite recovered. Looking at the face of the timer, you can see that it hasn't fully pulled back the, the coloration there. Um, and it's a little less natural in terms of the yellow on the cover of the veneer book. And so it's not as perfect, but at the same time, it's still doing a good job of recovering most all of the information and looked at on a global level. You know, it looks fairly natural, I would say. Now, I've yet to see a camera that does a perfect job of recovering highlights um, at a four-stop shadow recovery. And we can see that it's no exception here. This is a great performance, but it's not 
um, it's not going to be better than anything that I've seen before. And so you can see we've lost quite a bit of information there on the clock face, including that we're starting to lose like the contrast on the text there. Um, but definitely that color information is lost. This hot spot is just growing to where less and less information is recovered. Uh, some of that same kind of thing happening there on the book spine. And then up here you can see that some of that yellow color is just becoming unrecoverable and uh, looking much more unnatural, even the empire here. And so the byproduct of that is you start to get kind of a dull look because there's pieces of information that are not being properly recovered. Now, just to be fair, once again, that gives you an idea of what the baseline was. This is how overexposed that image was. And so all things considered, we've done fairly well here for pulling back information, just not in a fully believable fashion. So just to look at a real world shot here, I was uh, out hiking yesterday and saw this uh, Hercules military plane taking off over me. And so uh, my shot that I just, you know, quickly pulled up and uh, took a photo it was, you know, pretty severely underexposed. But you can see that I was able to pull back all the information. There's definitely some noise there that I could try to clean up if I was so inclined. But I mean, all of that information, all of that detail has been recovered from the shadows, which is quite impressive. Here's another one that was important to me. I was shooting in difficult conditions, shooting up, uh, and I saw this um, snowy owl up here. And so anyway, I was able to um, you know, recover the information you could see in the image on the right and get a really clean looking end result. You know, definitely when you consider what the original looks like. And so, you know, obviously that's very, very valuable. This is a good versatile sensor. So although it's only 24 megapixels, I have really been impressed by Sony's ability to, you know, get detail out of these type of sensors. And so you can see here looking throughout this frame, I just took this a couple of mornings ago, you can see how much detail there is, you know, all throughout and uh, kind of soft lighting conditions. And so it's not hugely a uh, lot of contrast here. But what you can see is this everywhere you look, there's really, really fantastic detail. And so that is something that has always impressed me about uh, these 24 megapixel sensors. Also really nice color here. I just found out in the field, I liked the uh, colors that I got in a variety of situations. You can see, you know, nice saturation levels, um, you know, just overall uh, pleasing, I would say. And so, there's just a lot about this particular sensor that I like. And, and so uh, overall, I, you know, I give a very positive endorsement of what I found when I tested the sensor on the A7C. And I also think that you know, pieces of software have gotten better at interpreting Sony colors as it's become more of a popular system. But the end product is, is that I'm happy with colors. And, and so the sensor performance here is just it's really great. And I am always pleasantly surprised by how much detail you're able to get out of this, you know, the 24 megapixels. It just seems like there's a lot of detail there. And so it, it doesn't feel like you're, in most situations, that you're lacking resolution. And so again, I'm really delighted about that. So at the end of the day, I guess it all boils down to how important going compact is to you. Um, you know, the as far as the actual ergonomics of the camera, I definitely prefer the A7 III's uh, body and handling. But at the same time, if you really want to go compact, you're not losing a whole lot in terms of the functionality. In fact, in many ways, you're actually gaining uh, functionality. You may be losing some function in terms of the ergonomics, but I think that at the same time, you are really gaining in a lot of other areas. So in a lot of ways, the A7C is a, it's a great camera for the right demographic. If you don't need to go compact, I think that there are better options. But if that is a priority and your idea of mirrorless is small and light, and this gives you a chance to go to full frame while still kind of keeping the body style and size of the A6000 series, the A7C might just be the camera for you. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you'll look in the description down below, you will find linkage to my uh, full written review, also to uh, an image gallery. You can check out photos, take them with the kit lens, but then also with a variety of other lenses. And also beyond that, there is linkage to purchase one for yourself, to follow me on social media, become a patron, sign up for my newsletter, and if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.